Okay, wonderful to have everyone coming in. Uh, please don't be shy. Make yourselves comfortable. This is going to be a, an energetic discussion about the topic that we all really care about, I hope. This is why we're here. So please um, join us. We are going to give people a few minutes. We know how these Zoom sessions work. People are, are usually dialing in on the last minute. Uh, but here we are. And uh, as you are trickling in, don't forget to put in the in the chat where you are calling from, where you are um, dialing from. So please do so. And uh, okay, New Jersey, welcome, Zakaria from New Jersey. Wonderful. Um, and I see familiar names here, some members of... Um, HCM team, students, faculty. That's exactly what we want to see here, really. And uh, we are looking forward to an incredible, you know, discussion on um, on this panel. Just a couple of, a couple of minutes. And um, just as a reminder, um, you are welcome to use the chat, but as far as the Q&A, uh, remember that there's a special button here that says Q&A, and uh, do uh, put your questions in there, and we promise that we are going to allow um, uh, some time at the very end of this presentation to engage with all of you um, in the discussion on the topic that Dr. Woody and I really care about so much that we took the pain of writing a book, <laughs> The Digital Coaching Revolution, that we are going to uh, to cover today. All right. Okay. So um, I'll give it just one more minute. So who do I see here? Uh, Brenda, Chow, Coco, Danielle, uh, David, Cooley, hello. Uh, Diana, uh, Hope, hello, good to see you, Kari, <laughs> Lauren, wonderful to have you in the room. All right, um, and I'm getting uh, down the list here. All right, okay, all right. Woody, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so uh, we, we're going to start with the Prerequisite introductions. If any of you do not know who we are, I'm Anna Tavis, um, the partner chair for human capital management. We are running this rethinking work series, um, and um, you know, really pushing the envelope on what's the future of HR, coaching, people analytics, and other and other topics. And and um, I'm the co-author of this book, Rethinking. Oh. Um, the digital coaching revolution. And uh, Woody, you will introduce yourself. Yes, hi, I'm Woody Woodward. I'm a clinical assistant professor of executive coaching and organizational consulting here at the NYU School of Professional Studies, where I'm also the director of the Coaching Innovation Lab. And yes, also Anna's co-author among many things um, of the digital coaching revolution. So I'm really excited to get a chance to do your show on a rethinking work, but also with you as both uh, kind of guest and host today. All right. Okay. So why don't we get started? Um, let me just share with slides again. Um, sorry, we, we're going to start. Let me just rewind the slides to the very beginning. Um, one second, we'll get you there. Um, and um, again, we are hoping for a conversation with all of you um, rather than a show and tell, but we um, do want to share with you a bit uh, of what we're prepared um, here today. So I'm going to start here. So Woody, why are we talking about the digital coaching revolution? This is pretty ambitious for us to say that there is a revolution in coaching specifically, 
and in the digital space? Well, I, I mean, it's something that Anna, you and I saw back in, in 2020 when I came to the program, I first joined and you hired me on as a as a professor here. We sat back and we're looking out at the landscape and what was going on. Uh, first, it was COVID, right? So it was a, a unique time in our history and a unique time for employees, particularly dealing with the challenges of either being home, working remotely, losing work, having to go in with PPE or other types of uh, challenges. And so many folks were just, were really struggling. And I know early on when we started the program, we started looking into, hey, what, what is going on in the industry outside of what we think of as traditional coaching? And we started paying attention to some of the digital coaching platforms, as many of them are referred to, who are offering coaching services, but what they would say at scale. And so I think the first meeting on a, my first meeting at NYU, the out, out external meeting when, is, was when you brought in uh, the team from Bravely. And we got to hear a little bit about what they were doing. And then we got in touch with the team from Ezra. We heard a little bit about what they were doing and, and we'll come back to these players in a little bit. But we started to realize that there's something going on here. And as we continue to have conversations with these these platforms and, and digital service providers, we realized they didn't really have one place to go. There was not one place where they all gathered because Anna, you know, we were trying to figure out well, where do we find them? How do we reach out to these folks and talk to them? And so we thought, well, why don't we create the space? Um, because it doesn't exist. So why not take an entrepreneurial approach, which I know is something that we've always have done and you've always encouraged and and everything that we do at, at the human capital management uh, department at, at SPS. So we decided let's put together an event and let's tap some of these folks and see if they'll come. And I would say what was fascinating was the response that we got. And I know I've told you this, Anna, quite frankly, I became a LinkedIn panhandler. I mean, mm -hmm. I was just out there pinging these folks. Hey, you know, we're doing this thing. We've got this program at NYU. And um, and I was shocked at how quickly they'd respond and say, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know more about that. The fact that you have a master of science degree in executive coaching was unusual and intriguing to them. And then the idea that, of course, we're NYU and we're putting together this event to bring these leaders and entrepreneurs together to talk about what they're doing in this space. I mean, I think that's what really got it started on it, got us interested in what was going on and then led to us investigating a little more about what was going on in the space and learning from now two years going on year three of the summit. Yeah, so, and that is the our website for the upcoming summit 2024, which will have the, um, new features, um, two day event at the Kimmel Center. We'll speak a little bit more about that, but I hope that you will join the conversation coming directly from here into that space. And so what we found out, you know, um, was that coaching was becoming what I call ubiquitous. So from being a sort of an esoteric, very, you know, niche uh, type of methodology working primarily with senior executives, it kind of started gaining momentum. And the premise behind writing this book, doing the research on the evolution of this particular uh, coaching methodology, what we discovered is and that what we believe in and and we i hope managed to prove in this book that coaching will be more of the mainstream way of learning with and not only that also managing people staying healthy and thriving at home and at work so that is kind of the the big claim that we are making and we are going to um, prove it to you to the extent that we can here and then again engage in this conversation. So what we found that the trends that are driving um, this whole 
mainstreaming of coaching. Sometimes you hear the word democratization. I prefer mainstreaming because democratization, especially in this political environment, tends to be a little bit more loaded. So, so coaching is becoming something that people are seeking at individual level. That's where hyper-personalization of these types of services come in. Remember us sitting in classes and training over and over again, LND was based on training, uh, but no longer, you know, we are going to get uh, through these technologies. That was our thesis, a very personalized and very kind of coach centered um, approach to learning. And on top of that, we because of the technology, we're able to deliver these personalized services at scale and in remote locations and all over the world. Anything here, Woody, you want to chime in? Yeah, I, I think it's important to, to to extend the conversation a little bit about the idea of democratization, because that's one of those things you and I have talked about. And early on, we talk about this in the book, and we're able to actually you know, to kind of chronicle this just about every single one of the major players in the digital coaching space we're, we're talking about democratization. Like, like every single one of them in some way, that was their differentiator, that was their purpose. And my pushback was always, you're democratizing or making coaching more uh, available within like Fortune 500, maybe Fortune 1000, right? Uh, and you're bringing it down from maybe executive ranks to like middle management. Some of them really went all in for the coaching for everyone, coaching for all individuals, frontline, when you're uh, uh, onboarding, coming in the door, uh, line employees. The, the challenge that we always saw with that is that even with a digital offering and your ability to match and pool coaches from around the world, you still are limited by the number of quality trained coaches you can get and deploy. So being able to deploy human coaches you know, through digital means at scale while maintaining quality became a real challenge for all, every single one of these players. And I think they started to realize it um, within a couple years in, and Anna and I certainly started, we started noticing that in the pivoting and the changing that each of these players were making, particularly when it comes into being more of a L and D provider with coaching as the way they led, right, to get into the space. Um, because we do know coaching is effective. We know that coaching is very hyper personalized, as Anna mentioned. But it is difficult to scale in the way they were talking about scale and coaching. Um, I know we'll come to it in a minute. Interestingly, AI has kind of swung that back around some, I think, in some unexpected ways that they probably weren't anticipating at the time. But it, it, we've gone through this uh, sort of wave of, of, yes, at the peak, we're going to democratize realization. Maybe we can't. To now, maybe we can do it in different ways. But Anna, to your point, I think it's more about access and availability of human development services. Some may be under the um, under the broad umbrella of coaching, but not maybe like coaching the way we think of it traditionally. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's where I agree. Uh, it, we It's not just about how coaching is going to be empowered through these texts, but also, and we will talk about it, how coaching itself is changing uh, as a result of adapting and uh, to these different um, uh, modalities that are becoming available. So a little bit of the history. I, my view, and Woody, I know you're going to address this, is that coaching in the word itself has been connected to technology because coach is a vehicle first and foremost. And it started in the university system where coaches were, you know, these vehicles transporting students to their tutoring sessions in the British educational system, which was based on tutoring. So Woody. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, roughly 1830s at Oxford, 
the idea of coach, as Anna said, which, you know, uh, a Hungarian, uh, a variation of a Hungarian word for a carriage, a horse-drawn carriage, right, that would carry people, it became a slang term, right, to say, oh, you've got a tutor, you've got someone helping you prep for your exam, so they called them a coach as a kind of way of saying, oh, they're just carrying you through, right, because uh, you can't do it yourself, and so on, so that's, that's where we first see the, the use of that term more broadly. And, and there's, there's a whole history of that, how it continued to get extended out. But the reality is the, the use of the term, right, comes from the 1830s in Oxford. But in reality, the idea of an individual deploying a certain type of skills to help in in one-on-one -on -one bespoke learning is certainly not new. We can date that back to Socrates. And Socrates probably is the most influential really through his students because he he never documented any of his methods himself. It was really Plato and others. But, but the Socratic method is still highly influential today, both in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, which has kind of led into cognitive behavioral coaching and a lot of just different coaching approaches, as well as mentoring. And we know on a, you know, going from Greek philosophy to, to Greek mythology, uh, mentor who is actually Athena in disguise as mentor helping aid Telemachus, right? The idea of mentoring came from, from uh, uh, Greek mythology and the Odyssey. So, you know, these terms have been around and they've morphed in different ways, whether it's uh, Machiavelli as an advisor, sort of in a uh, sort of uh, consultant coaching kind of way to modern day, you know, management history in the U.S., 1800s, I mean, with the movements of Frederick Taylor and others. So, uh, but we really saw in the U.S., I think, coaching at the executive level, that really one-to-one -one coaching that's kind of evolved to where we are today, probably uh, 1970s into 1980s and the more mainstream in the 1990s. Um, and then you saw the birth of ICF in 1990, was it 95 or 96, 1995, um, International Coaching Federation. And several years after you had the European Mentor Coaching Council um, and then others throughout throughout the, the, the world that, that really tried to get their hands around professionalizing what coaching is to the point, Otto, where we are today with the development of graduate education in coaching, which is something Anna and I are both very passionate about and believe is a critical next phase to really professionalizing coaching. But a part of that is also what's happened with the technology that's rapidly evolved and touched in coaching today. Yeah. And so looking at the future of coaching, um, and I want to make sure, Woody, that we get everything in. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of assisting somebody on their learning journey or, or their transformational journey or through personal challenges um, is, you know, again, goes back in, uh, in centuries, but the technology that assists us to do it has changed. And where the revolution, the next revolution in coaching comes in is what you see here in your visuals. The coaching it, it, it is, it already exists. And in fact, we were looking at three different waves of sort of um, of um, uh, uh, changing coaching through technology um, in this area of sports and sports um, development. First, with the data analytics that were introduced in, um, you know, allowing the athletes and their coaches to better understand the mechanics sort of of how they uh, perform and how they play. But now to the extent that where we see the most advanced merger of coaching and technology, the human coaching, as well as the data revolution and the coaching tools, and you can see here, to the extent that we already have a robot uh, representing coaching in some sports. Um, uh, so that's in sports, it's already um, a, the reality, along with a human coach. And we can discuss how those are in the symbiotic relationship. Um, and then what we are beginning to see in the day-to-day -day, um, 
operational even level at the workplace and which allows for the scale that was not available with human coaches um, in place that we are seeing the introduction of these avatars and other types of coaches coming in. And so um, so the what we covered in the book is really the explosion and Woody referred to it of all of these different um, uh, platforms. They started out as the platforms, but what you're going to see in the conference coming up is more and more uh, the insertion introduction of the AI coaches that replace humans and therefore to a certain in certain functions and therefore allow for um, a huge diversification of and the application of these coaching approaches. And I will just get through this. So obviously COVID was a huge accelerator where we started out with the platforms, you know, more like a social media or dating platforms, et cetera, et cetera. But because we were all forced into our respective remote locations, um, the acceleration of personalized services has extended where managers were no longer supervisors looking over your shoulder, but had to manage at a distance. So we believe that these were the factors um, that allowed for the acceleration of this coaching, digitization of coaches. So to the point where, you know, our initial premise Coaching now, and these are all, by the way, um, AI generated images. Um, coaches is ubi coaching is ubiquitous, is present in all sorts of different domains, not just in professional coaching as we think about it at NYU, but in well being, medicine, um, and all the other pursuits. So, coaches are going to be embedded in what we do. And um, and I also believe that we are going to see what Woody mentioned in the history of coaching, how the vocabulary around coaching, you know, involved a coach and mentor and trailer, trainer and advisor, et cetera. We're going to see uh, an explosion of new vocabulary, new words that will indicate different ways in which uh, this type of personalized assistance or personalized tutoring is going to be delivered. Woody, do you have any comment on the language of coaching? Yes, I think one of the most important things in that uh, I'm learning as, as uh, I participate in this whole evolution of how we talk about coaching is the kind of words we use to describe AI in particular and the, the role of AI in coaching really do matter. Um, and there's been some light research on this. I mean, certainly a lot of research on the use of language, but the more we're able to describe AI as a, an assistant, a co-pilot, a tool that feels a little more safer generally than as an, like an AI coach, right? Or a uh, um, an autonomous bot operating on its own, um, because that's where people tend to get a little bit uncomfortable. It depends on who you talk to, right? People who have been in coaching for a long time tend to get less comfortable with the idea of an autonomous bot or coach. Um, as you know, something I had shared, I, I had the opportunity to, to demonstrate uh, being coached by a voice-enabled GPT coach, uh, which was an interesting experience. It was a little clunky. It had some challenges, but when I posted the clip of that, or just a, a small like snippet of that interaction, some people had this, wow, that's fascinating and interesting. Um, and how does it work? Or here's some ways to improve it. Here are ways that it, we can adjust and change it. And others had very visceral, visceral, angry reactions at, first of all, how could you refer to it as a coach? It was so awful. The fact that it sat there and did that, what is it trained on? Um, why would you put that in front of an audience? Um, and, and then there's, you know, name calling and attacks and all that kind of stuff too, right? That we, that, you know, is part of, part of life on social media. Uh, but what pleased me was to, 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 and was informative was to see the range of thinking and reactions to an open-ended 
coaching question, which I just said, what do you think? Take a look, what do you think? Um, so Anna, I think it's, we really have to consider how we talk about AI and coaching, what we mean by AI and coaching, how we intend to use the tools and also how we're gonna, I think, either regulate or have a say in the development and deployment of these tools depending on the type of context they're going to be used in. And I know we'll get into some of that, but yeah. uh, language matters. Yeah. And, and, and I think we're going to see more and more like every single startup and we are going to have um, next generation companies, the ecosystem of uh, startups at the conference represented. Mm -hmm. They're actually trying to um, come up with their own um, vocabulary around guidance and coaching, et cetera, as different domains in which the um, coaching methodologies are being deployed are requiring a new way of thinking. And to your point, the coach kind of has been so anchored in a human one-on-one uh, -on -one relationship that uh, these new um, uh, sort of augmented AI-driven approaches to assistant, um, you, you know, called for a whole new generation of mm -hmm. um, uh, like and uh, of a language that uh, to describe it. And what I've done here is, um, you know, kind of reflecting back, it's not just that uh, the uh, the human coaches are going to be uh, getting those tools, but there's going to be a huge need around coaching people in their relationship to this technology. And I see uh, a, a really interesting opportunity for coaches because each and every one of us, what we're seeing um, is going to be defining what it means to you to be interacting the, with these types of tools. Uh, the research is just beginning to show up about how humans react, what would he describe in his particular coaching situation with a digital coach, but each and every one of us will have to define our level of comfort with these tools. And what we know is as everything is the case with humans, there's a whole range. There are people who feel that it's creepy and it's not something that they are going to engage with. And the exact opposite of that, where we see whole population, there's some research that's coming out where people are actually feeling a lot more comfortable with having an AI coach rather than having to confide in a human whom they might have for one reason or the other, distrust or mistrust of. So watch out for this. Even there's going to be, how do leaders lead you know with in this kind of ai empowered environment and the all different kinds of new coaching skills so just a real quick walk through before we engage in further conversation so where are we on this journey with um ai and kind of from the technology perspective let me just walk you through and and how it all works uh, with um, the employee life cycle. Um, all of you um, must be familiar with the uh, Gartner hype cycle uh, where they rate all the technologies on this hype cycle that goes through the patterns of evolution uh, pretty much for everything. As you can see, generative AI right now, and I have the, the, the purple star up there, is at the peak of inflated expectations. I love this terminology because it kind of prepares us for, you know, uh, to to uh, measure up and, and and really calibrate where we stand on all of these trends. You know, the expectations are very high, but they're also inflated, and and we can anticipate a little bit of the um, disillusionment that. Um, trough of disillusionment until we get to the slope of in, in enlightenment. And I think we are experiencing this with um, AI right now in, um, in coaching specifically. And uh, on the maturity model, um, most companies and most uh, of these platforms, et cetera, 
are sort of in between stage one and stage two, which is um, emerging stage where AI is being added to whatever else is there. Like look at our website. We now have a chat bot that can answer some basic questions. That's really emerging state, which is uh, which is very, very early uh, primary state in um, adoption of these types of technology. The first generation is built in and we're seeing that these tools are already be being in embedded in everything like Microsoft Copilot, right? Where we're going to have little coaching for us as we write our, you know, uh, emails. Um, it's going to pop up in, you know, the PowerPoints as we, it was through Canva and other types of um, tools. That's kind of the first generation AI built in co-pilots. And the second generation, which uh, we, of which there are just a few, where you can actually have indigenous sort of AI coaches. And I'm going to give you an example, which I think is absolutely fascinating because we have not seen much of it yet. I, I suspect that everyone is familiar with the emerging stage because it really started long before even the chat GPT and the first generation now with uh, Microsoft leading the way. So um, the second generation is here. Just be, But before I get there, Woody, I want you to comment on this really, really um, important aspect, especially in coaching of uh, running ethical, explainable, reliable, and responsible AI operation. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge, Anna, as you mentioned, right, and you look at the Gartner chart is that AI is evolving pretty fast, right? And and almost for twenty dollars a month, right? Anybody can have access to arguably one of the most powerful technologies we've ever created, right? Um, um, and so, with OpenAI and ChatGPT, everyone's out there. Everyone's trying it. They're using it. I, that coach bot I got, I, I got on and used on my phone. I don't know who created it. I don't know much about the person. I just went on for the purpose of demonstrations just to say, look, I typed in coach. This one came up. It's popular. Boom, I clicked it and I tried it. And what I think that we need to understand, first of all, just putting on my hat and thinking about coaching as a profession is just, Anna, as, as you and I saw with the digital coaching revolution and the digital coaching platform providers, because they were listening to the market, um, particularly during COVID. And because they were evolving their services and offerings to meet market demands, they came to redefine coaching in so many ways because the buyers of services were understanding coaching services from those who were offering them and those, who, uh, you know, the, the digital providers, right? Your better ups, Ezra's, Coach Hub's, Bravely's, Torch, Sounding Boards of the World, Ace Up, right? They were defining the market because that they were they had the loudest megaphones and they were the ones selling the services. So what we have to understand now is in this generation, right, of AI technologies for young users who are going to be you know, native to using um, generative AI. When they go on to a GPT store or they go to all GPTs or any of the other marketplaces that come up or internal corporate providers that, that offer the tools like a, a co-pilot on Microsoft, they're defining coaching by what they're seeing, right? By what is being called coaches. So we have to understand that. We don't have to love that idea, but we have to understand and respect that. And so that's why I think from an ethical perspective, we really need to, as a profession, make sure that we get a seat at that table to have some influence over what we actually mean by coaching. Because coaching is a loosely thrown around term and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And in fairness, you know, the professional coaching profession as in the, the folks like us that we're talking about, we don't own that word, right? There's sports coaching, there's, uh, you know, fitness coaching and well, all sorts of other coaching out there, right? That, that, that can be more directive and, and have power dynamics to them. So we have to understand, and 
in my role with the International Coach Federation and being part of the Thought Leadership Institute, um, where I'm also co-chairing at the uh, ICF Task Force on AI and Coaching, we're really looking into this and we're trying to get our hands around how do we help developers of technologies understand what we really mean by professional coaching and that there are standards, there are ethics, there are evidence-based practices that we teach here at NYU that we believe in that differentiate a coach from any random person off the street sitting down and coaching you or having a coaching conversation. So on a, when it comes to the ethics, we're looking at that right now. Um, it's an interesting challenge, but part of the ethics are in the development. And I don't know that we have enough influence over those developing the technologies at this point. We have some, we have, we've made some inroads with some of the, the larger developers of these technologies, but with many, we haven't. And so where are they taking their cues on ethics, on bias, right? I saw in the, in the Q and A, there was a question about bias. Yeah, we, we don't know, right? Because they're not sure what they mean by coaching. So how are they training these coach bots? Um, we just don't know. So I think we're at an inflection point in the profession where as professional coaches, we need to really lean in and engage. We cannot put our head in the sand. Uh, we can't fear what we're seeing. Uh, we don't want to attack it. We need to understand it, Take come at it with um, healthy skepticism, but with a willingness to say, guess what? The world's evolving and we need to be part of that and have influence over it. Right. And here, obviously, I'm sure people in the room right now are wondering, Woody, with all of your persuasive call to action, how do I get involved? How do I get involved? Um, I would say that the Europeans are a lot more proactive about uh, defining those standards and as you know, it, it will be a cascade across uh, because I think one, if if nothing else, but we've learned some lessons from social media and how social media was introduced and how far along we were until we realized all of the uh, consequences of um, unrestrained and, um, you know, uh, oftentimes unethical, uh, you know, behavior on those platforms. So I think in some ways I am a lot more optimistic in terms of the level of the discussion and awareness of these issues fairly early on as these technologies are racing out of the door of all of these companies. But let me... Um, uh, offer something that um, is kind of caught my imagination as I am beginning to get my arms around what would be involved in uh, this kind of, um, what I said, authentic uh, um, indigenous uh, AI coaching. Imagine that all of us will get our personal coach at work. And I know there are some questions there that we want to address. And here's what I found. There are we actually beginning to we will we are going to introduce in our curriculum at NYU for the coaching uh, for the um, human capital analytics and technology classes where our students are going to be developing their own coaches and these are uh, already the 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 built in coaches um, and and guidelines that are available and accessible to all of us we will be able to develop that already exists and commercially exists. We are going to be able to develop our own team of coaches um, in specific areas of expertise. And this is an example for you of one such company, and I'm not promoting any particular brand, but you're going to find them. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the gentleman to the left, um, Andrew Huberman, who's um health podcast. He's a neuroscientist uh, from Stanford. He's one of the most popular podcasters in the space of um, human uh, lifespan uh, and health. And here is an idea of how you can take the body of his knowledge and he's doing that himself as well, but we can just collect his information and develop an avatar um, 
uh, uh, based on, you know, a few guidelines um, that could be, you know, coaching us based on, again, a huge uh, knowledge base uh, that he made public uh, through the podcasts and other types of publications, etc. And on the right, you can see a website that represents uh, the team of coaches that may be available to you. It, let's say if you have an, for all different aspects of your life, um, as you can see here is a online marketing coach, but there's also a um, a health coach and a yoga coach and uh, different types of coaches, again, where you could take uh, the body of knowledge of an expert in this particular field and design this avatar. And then if let's say you want to have a holistic 360 coaching approach to your own performance at work, but you also want to engage, you know, how is my, you know, my fitness level, how is my performance in whatever aspect of your life, um, you, you know, your presentation coach, et cetera, et cetera. You can run that particular question through these different team of coaches and get a perspective from their respective set of expertise and those are already in existence it's really fascinating to see obviously still early stages but um uh you know the implications of how we work when we are able to have all of these coaches available to us um customized to our needs and uh, you know aligned with you know, the gurus, the thought leaders, the uh, teachers whom we respect and who make their body of knowledge available to us, whether for free or at cost. Like, for example, Marshall Goldsmith has created his own coaching avatar, which is intended to provide his, his type of coaching to anyone at, at, at a certain price, right? You can get uh, Marshall Goldsmith. Uh, coaching advice without actually talking to him himself just by paying membership or subscription, et cetera. But anyway, these are the types of coaching solutions that are on the horizon. They're beginning to be available, you know, at a, at the consumer level. This is where democratization that we talked about or mainstreaming of coaching and the agency uh, Woody, to your point, right now we are still kind of whatever AI coach is available on the platform, but we are going to be able to design our own team of coaches and select the right kind of coaches whom we want to hear from, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so what are the skills that are going to be really critical for us, both as coaches and as a recipients of coaching services to develop? if all of this is going to be coming, you know, to the classroom next door? Well, I, one is familiarity with the technology, right? I mean, you need to become familiar. The other thing I would mention on is uh, one of the most trafficked sites out there right now is Character AI. Mm -hmm. uh, if anyone hasn't gone on there, it, it's very similar to what Anna was describing, but people put on there, they create an upload, um, uh, information, books, writings, media interviews of, of famous characters and try to recreate famous uh, characters from history or, you know, in media that you can interact with. I mean, that that's a very heavily trafficked site right now. It's one of the most popular ones. So it, 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 it's there, it's out there, it's happening. Um, but I think the ideas we, we talked about earlier is how to use, utilize the technology to augment your work, not necessarily to replace your work. And I think the thing we're all trying to figure out right now is what is uniquely human in our interactions and what is replicable uh, or easily mimicked um, uh, and, and what may be kind of routine uh, in our human interactions. Because 
I, I don't think we have figured out that answer, but I think we're slowly grappling with it. Um, you, one of the things that there's been research on goal-focused coaching uh, from Nikki Terblanche out of Stellenbosch University in South Africa, where he was able to demonstrate that just text-based coaching, this was a pre-generative AI, very command and control, was as effective at helping someone set and maintain uh, adherence to a goal program and attain those goals than if they were working with a human coach. Um, so that's, it's, it's early days. That's only one study. It's an interesting finding. Um, it was based on some of his own, uh, technology that, that he had created, but it's still telling that there are some things that technology can replace. So we need to think about what are those things and is that okay? And then what are things that can't replace, right? So that sensitive one-on-one -on -one interaction, the ability to detect energy, in a room sitting with somebody, right? Because remember, these are voices and their text right now. They're not actual, or maybe cartoons or avatars, but they're not really a person, right? Who perceives or has the same level of agency or sentience, right? That a human coach would have. So and I, we have to think about that. Um, you mentioned ethics, right? Does a coach understand ethics? Does a coach understand the flow of a conversation um, and, and when to come in and out of a conversation. Uh, you know, sometimes humans don't either, right? We're all can be guilty of that, the, the bad party guests and so on that interrupts. But so the, the ability to have compassion, the ability to genuinely identify with you and actually care, right? These, I believe, right now are still very human things, that connection. Um, so, yeah. I, you know, yeah, and I can where see are. where you're going. And, and you know, where, where I want to conclude is I personally think that we need to rethink the term artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. because in my view, it's not artificial. It starts with humans. It ends with humans. And it's just a different vehicle as the coach was in the old days of connecting, you know, humans to humans end to end. It's a human endeavor. It, that's one thing. Intelligence, you know, you mentioned all the connection and the relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Where this technology is going, unlike the calculator that, you know, changed our lives in so many different ways it actually is tapping into something very, very specifically human that is not just intelligence. It's the emotions, it's the, um, you know, um, em uh, emotional intelligence in a different way. It's the, it, it, it is a technology that is tapping into the very human qualities of relationships. And we will need to be looking out for where it's taking us. And as I promised in the beginning, when we said revolution, we in the in the title of the book, it's just a snapshot in time. You know, it's almost like Woody and I are aware that what we we're trying to capture is the beginnings of a huge movement and paradigm shift in um, you know, how these trends are going to transform everything we do. And again, to return to the question of, uh, the role. So let me make it specific about what are we doing at NYU to stay current and prepare our students and educate them on or help together. We are in this discovery process together along with our students. Mm -hmm. and that is something that, you know, we are very acutely aware of. So I will give Woody a chance to comment on uh, you know, what we are doing in the executive coaching or consulting uh, program. And then I will say a few words about how we providing additional uh, coaching, co coaching education and coaching skill development opportunities at the um, certificate level. Yeah. I mean, we have to be at the forefront, right. As, as a university, um, as an education and trainer or educator and trainer of coaches. So one of the things we've done is we integrated um, a technology called Ovita, which is a, a video capture technology that 
actually records the conversations, analyzes and captures data about the coaching interactions, allowing our coaches to practice, but get objective data about uh, their interactions during that coaching conversation. The AI also transcribes it. The AI captures what happened. It writes about it. It gives you the main points. So our students have been for almost two years now using that AI-driven technology for their own training purposes, which is incredibly important. And in our research process and methods class, we've integrated um, uh, the concept of looking at and using AI technologies like a chat GPT in our research, but also our students have been asked or, or assigned to take positions on the use of AI and to prognosticate on how they think they'll use AI and how it will evolve into their practice. So we're doing everything we can on it to prepare them for the future. First and foremost, they get the foundations, right, of being a coach based on evidence-based practice, how to be that human coach but they're also, we're integrating the use of technology to help train them, make them better, and helping them understand and comprehend the kind of positions they need to have and what what they need to know about the, the technology that continues to evolve. Yeah, and on the certificate side, um, we are actually going to be a lot more edgy and experimental. Uh, we are going to introduce a variety of different uh, skills specialties that even our and uh, students in the master's program can then return to and continue to grow. Uh, we are going to develop a separate certificate in healthcare coaching. We're beginning on that process, uh, which requires additional set of uh, qualifications. And, um, and we are contemplating a, um, a, a separate uh, class or program uh, for the design of these particular AI coaches with the skills that will be helpful, hopefully, to our students when they can create their own avatars and, and be much more fluent in, obviously, that will be for the for the students who are already, you know, coach certified, et cetera. So watch out for that space because we feel as an educational program that we have an obligation to offer these uh, development options to our students. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's where our um, mind is going. And obviously, all of these um, different avenues will be explored at our next conference in June um, to see, you know, where we can take it and what kind of partnerships, because a lot of this also emerges from the partnerships with these advanced and um, AI-driven um, kind of organizations. So this is kind of where we wanted to end. And I know that we have a couple of questions. Um, I think, so first of all, uh, Lauren, um, a question more kind of from the uh, HR perspective. Um, you know, there are already a lot of systems, HRS systems that are out there. Uh, you know, that question is based on the kind of the first generation AI thinking that AI or coaching is something as 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 uh, add on rather than in embedded in all the other solutions. For example, uh, Lauren, all of these HRS systems, talent marketplaces, and other types of um, uh, you know systems that are out there for various HR purposes are beginning to integrate with the coaching programs. Same as what um, uh, Microsoft is doing with their tools, where you're going to get these assistance uh, co-pilots through uh, Microsoft tools. So you don't need to buy an additional system. It's just going to be a function of how a learning and development talent marketplace um, yeah, operates where you, in addition to telling you what kinds of skills you might have, and you already see it, for example, the uh, commercially available LinkedIn, LinkedIn has built a whole bunch of AI uh, assistance into its own, um, uh, its own platform. When we go on out there now, it's helping us in multiple ways um, to communicate. So right now, 
yes, there it's kind of a, a bolted on maybe, and companies started out with those platforms that we mentioned by buying subscriptions to those programs. But now they are integrating, like BetterUp is integrated with Workday right now. Um, so the, the, they are going to be an integral part and extension of everything HR is doing. Um, Woody, I think you answered the uh, raised question about DEI, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the quick answer is that we have to look at the large language models that these uh, technologies and AI are being trained on first. We also have to look at the the subset models that they're being more specifically trained on and the guardrails that they're being given. But another way to flip that on its head, uh, Ray, would be to think about the idea of AI type bots, agents, AI generated or, or, or driven coaches as a way of providing access and making them more affordable and available to marginalized communities that otherwise couldn't afford coaching services from a digital provider or from human coaches uh, or are in areas or places where access would be much more difficult. Um, you know, I'm, I've had the chance to work with someone who's doing that. He's developed AI for inner city high school kids, um, uh, like a, a, a coaching bot for them. Um, and he did it because he found he couldn't raise the money and wasn't able to afford to provide them the, the access to human coaches. And so he did it not to replace something. He did it to fill a space where there was nothing. Um, so I think we have to consider that. Well, when I hear a lot of angst about AI, we also have to consider where can AI be used uh, where we otherwise don't have a presence or can't provide help? How can it provide help? Yeah. And if I could add to this, uh, Woody, we, in fact, at our conference, we're going to have a couple of couple of uh, uh, providers to exactly, you know, marginalized communities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what they are finding when I was talking to them, um, they're, they're mostly using chatbots and not because uh, there's no human involved. There are lots of humans involved on, on the back end, but what they're finding is that their clients are a lot more open and, to uh, the interaction with the chatbots than with the humans, especially, you know, they can relate better. It comes at the, um, you know, at the time and convenience of these kids who uh, might need assistance at the most, you know, inconvenient times for the humans. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we're going to have that broader conversation about how address those issues. And I do believe that to Woody's point that we are actually going to be able to a reach out to the communities that have never, never had any sort of access to these types of tools before. I am aware that we are at the very end. Please feel free to reach out to Woody, myself, our team. Uh, we are going to continue with our series until the end of the academic year. Next, our next um, topic is going to be uh, about consulting with our own Professor Mary Ciani. Uh, that's going to happen on Tuesday, the uh, April 16th. Um, then uh, we are also have another one more on the uh, strategic workforce planning, more kind of core HR uh, webinar. And, uh, and when it comes to in-person conversation, do join us at the summit um, in June. Um, uh, uh, and we just want to just to plug in, we are also going to have part two of this summit in Berlin um, in June, uh, on June 2021. Uh, our first kind of global, we have a lot of global participants in the New York summit, but we are actually taking it to Europe for the first time. Thank you all so much. Fantastic to see everyone. Thank you. And uh, we will see you very soon again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.